What makes a villain memorable? The most iconic villains come in all shapes and sizes. They can be chaotic, efficient, charming, repulsive, charismatic. But if you ever want to write your own perfect antagonist, then there's no better example to learn from than Gus Fring. Created by Vince Gilligan and performed by Giancarlo Esposito, Fring ticks every box for what makes a villain not just memorable, but terrifying. Breaking Bad's Walter White is hailed as one of the greatest characters ever written, but a hero is only as strong as the villain they have to conquer. And for two of the most intense seasons of television ever created, that's Gus Fring. So now that Better Call Saul has come to an end, we have two complete series to study his rise, his reign, and his fall. So let's take a deeper look at the qualities that make this character work so well, so that you can apply it to your own writing. As Vince Gilligan is a master at ensuring his character's key qualities consistently feed into one another so that it all feels natural. It starts with how we meet the character, as first impressions mean everything with a villain. Some crime lords are introduced surrounded by soldiers, or dripping with wealth, or fearlessly engaging in violence so we know they mean business. But for Gus Fring, he hides in plain sight. You don't find him, he finds you. This creates an immediate mythical quality to the character, akin to Kaiser Soze in The Usual Suspects. And like that, he's gone. And someone that's capable of keeping their identity a secret, while running such a hugely dangerous operation, is far more intimidating, as it means they manage to tightly control everyone around them into complete silence. And if you can't find them, they could make you disappear with ease. But Gilligan doesn't just make it so that Fring is a mysterious drug kingpin that runs a fast food franchise. He gradually unravels his community ties, how he plays a sort of public figure, acting friendly with law enforcement, keeping his friends close and enemies closer. By writing Fring as someone that wears an upstanding mannerly mask in public, while being a ruthless murderer in private, it immediately ups the stakes for the characters, and thus our experience as viewers. Firstly, even being capable of pulling off such an act suggests he's a high operator, but it also communicates that human interaction is all just a strategy to get the outcome he wants, so therefore he must feel nothing about the morality of his crimes. On top of that, this means protecting his image always takes precedence, and once that's jeopardised, the risk must be eliminated. So on every level, the stakes are higher, and the game is more complex. In order to make the previous points plausible, it takes a certain kind of person to be able to pull it off. The phrase, how you do anything is how you do everything, definitely applies here. Gus is meticulous. Everything is done with precision and attention to detail. The way he puts on his clothes, the way he sits, the way he stands, even the way he speaks, is precise. He knows exactly what he can and cannot say and will use code to never fully incriminate himself, or let you know what his plans are. Sir, if you have a complaint, I suggest you submit it through our email system. All right, I'll bring him in now. No. Keep him there. Wait. Let it be a mistake. This discussion serves no purpose. He says only what you need to hear, and no more. But this isn't just how he works, it's what he loves. Notice how Gus is drawn to people that take great pride in what they do and thrive to be the very best at it. When he walks in on Gale playfully singing the periodic table as he works, Gus smiles as it suggests Gale lives and breathes chemistry. When he discovers Walt Cook's meth that's over 99% pure, he needs to work with the very best, a fellow master of their craft. And what attracts him to David is his deep knowledge of wine. He's so passionate and captivated by the small, intricate details of each bottle that Gus can see a part of himself in him. Conversely, he can't stand sloppiness and inconsistency. For example, he doesn't value Jesse because he's an addict. And an addict is controlled by a substance, not logic, reason, money, or him. And he doesn't think Eladio deserves his position because he's not cautious enough, choosing to rule by fear and infamy rather than secrecy and control. If you want to write a well-rounded villain, you have to not think of them as just a baddie. They should have just as lofty goals and motivations as the protagonist. 
Gilligan ensures that Fring isn't just sitting pretty on his laurels, he's the active hero of his own story, constantly expanding. He may be the most powerful kingpin in the state, and to Walter White, but even Gus has someone he answers to, and those above him are not friends. While most mob stories involve family, Gilligan shows us how Gus started off as an outsider, just trying to capture the cartel's attention. But his plan resulted in his partner, who was maybe more than just a business partner, being murdered by Hector Salamanca right in front of him. And Gus was forced to look him in the eyes in horror to understand the consequences of his actions. Since then, he has been subservient to Don Eladio's needs, silently moving chess pieces until he's ready to execute his plan. Gilligan could have just written Gus as the ultimate baddie who runs the world, but instead, it's all about perspective. He's a major player, but he has not yet completed his goals, or crushed his enemies. And when we see the story from his side, we're actually rooting for him to conquer his competitors by taking revenge. Once we understand Gus's goals, it recontextualizes how our hero fits into the picture. Essentially, he wants to use Walt's cooking skills to take over the market and complete his plan, and Walt can make more money than ever before. But rather than this symbiotic relationship just working out, Gilligan instead makes Gus not just a ruler and threat, but a mentor. Unlike most stories, in Breaking Bad, the villain is the perfect person for Walt to learn from, as he's unquestionably just a better criminal than him. He does everything right, whatever needs to be done, he usually doesn't let emotion get in the way. Unlike Walt, who often makes decisions based on expedience and ego. So in order to beat the monster, you have to become an equal or greater monster. This is key, because it's not just good guy versus bad guy. Now that we know Gus's background, we're presented two protagonists, who both want to become the largest meth dealer in the country. But one is far more powerful than the other, and this power struggle will become the central conflict of the series. Essentially, Walt and Gus are both in a race to learn everything the other person does right the fastest, so they can eliminate them. Being in this arms race is an intriguing conflict, as Walt and Gus are very different. Walt feels he's short on time, having been diagnosed with terminal lung cancer and living with huge regrets, so he wants everything to happen now. Whereas as we see from Better Call Saul onwards, Gus's greatest strength is patience. He does not execute any plan until he knows it can be completed with absolute efficiency. This is why no matter how often Gale offers to start cooking meth for him, whether it be in his work lab or in the hole in the ground, Gus always says no, as he believes you start as you mean to continue, and to begin too early would be an emotional miscalculation. Nothing happens until everything is in its right place. This has been a quality of his since he was a child, and Gilligan plants these seeds in his most defining monologue, in which Gus tells the story from when he was just seven years old, living in poverty. He tended to a dehydrated lacuma tree that never bore fruit, but he fixated on it until green buds began to grow. He then took the fruit in secret and enjoyed it alone, so we can see that secrecy was always part of his wheelhouse. Then they began to sell the fruit to the local community, demonstrating his entrepreneurial side. But then the tree was attacked by an animal, so to crush his enemy, he built a trap, wounding the creature. And when it ran under the house to hide, he waited patiently for hours into the night until it revealed itself, and then captured it. The easy thing to do would have just been to kill it, but once he feels wronged, Gus enjoys revenge. Even as a child, he kept the creature alive for some time, so it could slowly perish in agony. And this is the same tactic he wants to employ on Hector for killing his partner Max. And when the doctor shows him his progress, the thing that brings a genuine smirk to his face is knowing that the real Hector is still in there, trapped in his own body like a prisoner. He wants him conscious but debilitated, so he can drag out his punishment for longer. But this is what Gilligan does best, he builds character traits and links them together to create true consistency. We know Gus is meticulous from how he moves, we know he's patient from how he makes decisions, and we know he likes to operate in complete secrecy. But it's not just to law enforcement, it's to everyone. 
He ate the lakuma in secrecy, as he gains more pleasure from something knowing that no one else knows about it. And when he patiently builds his underground lab, hidden below an industrial laundromat, he keeps it a secret from Eladio and the Salamancas, until he has the perfect cooks ready to produce the amount of product he needs. Secrecy is vitally important, because knowledge is power. This is why he has eyes and ears everywhere, watching everything. But also limits how much you know, and how much you think he knows. This way he can sniff out deception immediately, and leaves his competitors making decisions based on incomplete information. For example, when he discovers Walt is Hank's brother-in-law, he doesn't instantly react or let Walt find out he knows. Instead, he waits and executes a strategy that kills two birds with one stone. Let's take a closer look at this one, because great writing is all about how and when to reveal certain pieces of information to the audience and the characters. Sometimes we know something the characters don't, and sometimes we're a step behind or just as perplexed as them. In this case, we think Gus is just sending the twins after Hank to protect Walt and cut out a potential threat. However, we then don't know why he would warn Hank just before the attack. But then his larger plan becomes clear. In a masterstroke, he warned Hank just before the attack happens so that the twins get shot. And with an attack on a DEA officer, the feds are now all over the Mexican cartel, cutting off their supply to the US. At the exact time he has Walt in place to produce industrial amounts of meth in his underground lab. So he plays one person's desire off his personal need, distracts and shuts out his competitors, while capturing the entire market for himself. He is killing two birds with one stone, but the play is about much more than just Walt or Hank. And it's only when Walt lies to him about his whereabouts, that he personally visits him in hospital to send the message that he already knows more than he could possibly imagine. So therefore his lies will never work. By being patient, having secrets, and access to all the information, Gus can orchestrate complex strategies with minimal risk. He's a master manipulator, wearing different faces with different people so that no one can see their strings getting pulled. He employs different psychological strategies to control his subordinates, often putting them into categories. With Nacho and Jesse, he considers them erratic and untrustworthy. When Mike requests Nacho be let go, as he has been a loyal servant, Gus states, A dog who bites every owner he's ever had can only be disciplined with a firm hand, or put down. When Walt turns down his lucrative job offer, he hires Jesse instead, so that Walt's jealousy and pride will fly into overdrive. He then lets him believe the lab was built with him in mind. And when Walt feels guilty over losing his family, Gus changes tack to activate Walt's ego and sense of purpose. A man provides. And he does it even when he's not appreciated. He simply bears up. And he does it because he's a man. Gus studies his opponents so he can read the man in front of him, as you can't control what you don't understand. He knows that Walt wants to be known as the best, that he wants his ego fed at all times. Even when punishing Jesse like the dog who needs discipline, he deepens their divide by building Walt up in the process so that he feels like his equal. If it wasn't for this man, and the respect I have for him, I would be dealing with this in a very different way. And once he senses a threat growing underneath him, he pits them all against one another. Gale can replace Jesse, Jesse can replace Walt, and perhaps Victor could replace Jesse. The aim is to use fear as a motivator, that you'll just comply with his desires and act grateful for all he's given you, rather than questioning or interrupting his larger plans. Given his public persona, Gus has to keep a safe distance between himself, the Order, and the crime. This is an important detail for how Gilligan ties the characters' qualities together to maximise the tension. Gus is meticulous. He's always cleaning up, or clean, in every sense of the word. Which is why it's all the more shocking and powerful when he gets his hands dirty. To make a statement to the witness. Like when he bags Nacho's partner. Or when he marches into the lab after Jesse shoots Gale and without saying a word, manages to send the strongest message imaginable. 
The scene lasts for over 10 minutes, Gus slowly taking off his business suit and gradually coating himself in a hazmat suit, signalling something dirty is about to happen. He then picks up the box cutter and slowly circles around Jesse and Walt like a shark, letting them get a good intimate look of the weapon, and then brutally cuts Victor's throat and lets the blood spray on top of him as he holds unbroken eye contact with both witnesses. The act is a complete power flex that he can do this and no one will stop him or even have the courage to verbally object. And his clinical reaction to the bloodshed only proves how little the act means to him and how close they are to being next. It's a harrowing experience for the characters and the viewer that reveals a completely new and even darker side to Gus Fring than we thought possible. Even though he doesn't capture that much screen time during Breaking Bad, his presence is felt in every scene. Just seeing a camera or his men watching you creates instant tension for the viewer. Walt, Jesse, Nacho all feel out of control of their own destiny because they exist under the cloud of his omniscience. In cinema and television, we've seen all sorts of villains. But with Gus Fring, I would argue that Vince Gilligan created the most calculating, controlling and efficient villain ever portrayed on screen. The type of man to poison himself just to poison you. The type of man who gains pleasure from informing you that your entire family is dead. Someone so ruthless that just knowing someone has become an obstacle in his path is enough to send shockwaves throughout the entire story. That's no easy task. As in order to write a character that's so meticulous, your writing needs to be just as precise from beginning to end. But if you can pull it off, it elevates every aspect of your story. As no hero is truly admirable, unless the villain feels truly unbeatable. If you enjoy content like this and want to see more of it, please do consider supporting me on Patreon, as it really does make a difference to how much content I can pump out. Or if you can't afford that, then simply like the video, subscribe, and leave a comment down below to help the algorithm do its thing.